Okay, so welcome to the colloquium. Uh, I just want to remind you again that all our talks are uh, online after a few days. You can just watch them and we have that on YouTube. So we have a YouTube channel where you can see all the... So thanks to uh, Jan Lebitsky for the, for the technical realization of this, our cameraman. And now I give the word to, word to Thomas Henning. So it's a real great pleasure to welcome Erk Herbst here in Heidelberg. If you ever worked in acid chemistry, uh, you will easily realize that he's one of the fathers of this field. Uh, he wrote a very influential paper together with Bill Klemperer uh, many years ago. I will not cite the year. Um, but it practically answers the question, why do we have actually chemistry in space? So it was a paper about iron molecule chemistry. Uh, it was very influential, and uh, from that time on, the field took off. Um, uh, I did a PhD in Harvard, 1966, as far as I found out. Uh, maybe you don't remember, but that was two years before it got really uh, hot in Harvard, uh, 68, so you did it right. Uh, then uh, he moved to a number of places, uh, but he was also in Germany uh, in 88 and 89, as uh, supported by the Humboldt Foundation, mainly in Cologne. These days we are very proud to attract him to Heidelberg as well, so he frequently went back to Bonn in Cologne, uh, spent there a lot of time. Uh, then he got a uh, professor both in actually chemistry and physics and in astronomy at Ohio State University. Uh, he told me that he was never paid by the chemistry department. He was only very little paid by the astronomy department, but mostly by the physics department. Uh, but I think in the reverse order, he worked uh, on chemistry mostly, and then in astronomy, and then in physics. Uh, he's now a professor also at the University of Virginia, a very special uh, professor there. And uh, this is, of course, a center for radio astronomy. Uh, and I think that's also the reason for the title today of your talk. Uh, you will talk about new telescopes, I think about one especially, uh, new expectations uh, and even puzzling results. Eric, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Uh, are we, can people hear me? Yes? Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm very thankful to be invited to, to, to speak here. I've been, I've been giving other talks in Germany on this visit, talking mostly about complex molecules in space. But since I, this is an audience uh, mainly of astronomers, I thought I, I'd uh, do, do something different and talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, role or what new telescopes are allowing us to do in, in, in astrochemistry. And of course, I'm going to talk about projects that I've been involved in. And uh, many of these are, are, well, most of these are still uh, partially explained only. All right. So the telescopes are of two types. The, the first uh, has to do with uh, observing the heavens in the far infrared, which can't be, uh, can't be done from the ground. And this is a picture, of course, of, the, of, of Herschel, the European Space uh, Agency telescope. And uh, so I have been involved on a variety of projects uh, with this telescope. Far infrared, from the point of view of molecules, uh, it allows you to see uh, rotational transitions of very elementary light molecules, and also allows you to see very, very slow, uh, very low frequency vibrational motions of, of other molecules. So it's, it's very complementary information to what uh, we already have. And uh, another telescope of this type is, is the SOFIA Airborne Observatory. All right, perhaps even more, uh, more revolutionary are the interferometers that are, we are now being used, the, the, the VLA, the SMA, and here's the picture, an old picture now of ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And interferometers, of course, consisting of many little telescopes, uh, have very, very uh, uh, lots of collecting area, and so can see weak signals, 
and make them much stronger and also have very, very high spatial resolution. So everything we used to think was homogeneous now becomes heterogeneous and much harder to understand. In addition, from the frequency point of view, this telescope is what's called a broadband telescope. So you can look over very, very wide uh, frequency uh, regions, uh, which means you can map uh, the numerous molecules all at the same time. So you get a lot of information, perhaps too much information, and then poor uh, simulators, uh, theoreticians like myself have to try to understand them. But before we could uh, uh, look at uh, what we're beginning to learn from these telescopes, I want to give you an introduction to the field of astrochemistry. Starting in about 1970 or so, uh, polyatomic molecules started being discovered in space and uh, in the gas phase, uh, for the most part. And right now, so many molecules have been seen, I'm not even sure I have an up-to-date number. I used to write a, a lovingly a list of all these molecules, but I've given up on that because there are too many of them. Anyway, there are about 170 of these molecules if you uh, don't count all the isotopes, which makes it many more. Uh, most of them are neutral, but some are uh, molecular ions. And what, what this shows is that uh, even, even in the coldest interstellar objects, I mean, interstellar space is still a plasma, maybe a weak plasma, but there always is a reason, some ionization, and so there are molecular ions, both positively and negatively charged. Uh, hydrogen is, of course, the dominant element. The carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are very um, important. And so throughout the, in the interstellar medium, in, in, in every galaxy that we look, I mean, the chemistry is overwhelmingly organic. That means carbon-containing molecules, and likely the oxygen and nitrogen as well. We used to say up to 13 atoms in size, but there's been a big jump when these molecules of 60 and 70 uh, uh, carbon atoms were seen. So now we could say up to 70 atoms in the gas phase. Although, of course, the most molecular, the most abundant molecule by far is molecular hydrogen with carbon monoxide, the, the second most abundant one. The dominant technique for looking at molecules is to look at what's called a rotational spectrum in emission, and this occurs from the radio throughout uh, the, up to the far infrared, depending on, on, the, on the molecule and how much it's excited. All right, if we uh, take a look, uh, there are many different types of objects in the interstellar zoo, but if we take a look at one that's relatively well understood, are these cold, dark clouds. Uh, this is actually a well-known optical, classic optical plate in, in, in astronomy. And what you, what you see here, of course, or you don't see, is just blackness. And that means the background starlight in the visible is, uh, is extinguished uh, very efficiently, mostly by dust particles, which represent about 1% of the mass in clouds of this sort. And uh, to study them, to get the information we get, you, you have to go to longer wavelengths which means the infrared and uh, anything longer than the infrared. I wrote that millimeter wave, but uh, some millimeter wave, far infrared, uh, uh, and the other end are radio waves as well. All right, they, they each have, the longer the wavelength, the lower the extinction. So you could actually do some sort of spectroscopy that is looking at individual frequencies. We learned a variety of things. Molecules are very good probes. We learned that these regions, although they look black, are quite heterogeneous. The densest portion, I've sort of drawn, drawn a cartoon here, are called cold cores, and uh, some of these are indeed collapsing to form low-mass stars. And uh, typical density is 10 to the fourth atoms and molecules per cubic centimeter, typical temperature 10 Kelvin. And uh, the molecules that are seen, and I'll show you some spectra, are very exotic by terrestrial standards. Of course, it's not clear whether we're exotic or they're exotic, but in any case, it's quite different from what one sees uh, in, uh, on Earth. It, at least in these cold cores. And we th we've been th thought uh, since the 70s that we basically understand the, the reason for it, and I'll, uh, I'll go into that later. All right, so for those of you who've had some chemistry, here are examples of very exotic molecules. Okay. First, they're molecules that have a positive charge. This is in, still in the gas phase and molecules that have negative charges. If you had a, a one year of chemistry, you would not think that any of these molecules could really exist in the gas, but they do. They're quite happy to exist under these uh, conditions. These are what chemists would call isomers. Isomers are, are unusual higher energy structures. 
corresponding to, to basic molecules. For example, HCN with the, uh, the H next to the C next to the N is a very well-known molecule. It could kill this audience here in a very short period of time if you breathed it. But HNC is very hard to make on Earth. You have to heat this HCN to very high temperatures because this occurs at much higher energies. In the cold interstellar medium, it's equally abundant with uh, HCN. Okay. And some of these things are even stranger. And uh, these molecules, uh, well, this is chemistry shorthand for the structure, but they do tend to be very linear. And organic molecules on Earth don't be. Organic molecules on Earth are, uh, uh, are also uh, not, lin they're not linear, and they have much more hydrogen in them. It is crazy that hydrogen is the most abundant element, but it doesn't appear much in these molecules. Anyway, there are three-membered rings. On Earth, most rings are six-membered rings. Radicals are species with an odd number of electrons. And here's an example of what's called the carbon chain. It's 11 carbon atoms in a row and a line, a nitrogen at one end and a hydrogen at the other. So take it from me, these are quite exotic. They're not exotic enough that people haven't been able to study their spectra, their rotational frequencies in the laboratory, in discharges, for example, because otherwise we wouldn't know what the spectra were. So here is a spectrum from a, a very well-known cold core called the Taurus Molecular Cloud 1 in the region I showed you. This is called the microwave in frequencies. It's 10 to 50 gigahertz. It's actually uh, taken by a very old radio telescope celebrating this month's its, its 30 year, 30th year. It's the Nobuyama Telescope in, in, in Japan. So this is, the, this is what's called the spectrum. All the molecules in this cloud are emitting at characteristic frequencies, which allows us to know what the molecules are. It looks very crowded here, so I've spread it out a little. It's not that crowded uh, compared with warmer sources that have even, even denser spectra. This is different from laboratory spectra in two ways. Uh, first of all, in a laboratory, you, you would try only in a discharge cell to have one type of molecule. <laughs> that always happens, but that's the goal. Here you have uh, at least 50 different molecules. Also, this is a spectrum that's in emission, which is, uh, which is unusual in the laboratory. Typically, one sees spectra in this region of the electromagnetic spectrum in absorption. Uh, there are absorption spectra seen from space as well. It's less common in, in, in this region because there aren't many types of lamps that one could use to emit at long wavelengths. All right, well, this then is e emission, and it's actually caused by collisions. So one molecule collides with another, puts it into an excited rotational state, and then the, the molecule emits. Now, the, these, uh, once you know what molecules are there, these are excellent probes of the physical conditions. So one learns about uh, density, overall density, and temperature, and heterogeneity in these, in these parameters, motions of the cloud through Doppler effects, whether it's collapsing, whether it's rotating, whether both are happening. So they are excellent probes from the point of view of astronomers. All right, what about dust particles? Well, these are a little harder to study. Uh, you can study them in the rotational spectroscopy. They do, the molecules don't rotate in a solid. You have to study them in the infrared in which you pick up vibrational motions. The infrared uh, absorption, uh, which is how you normally study these with background infrared lamps of one sort or another, uh, very, give you very, very broad features. And so it's not easy to distinguish one molecule from another. Also, the technique is less sensitive for a variety of reasons, e even uh, when the, uh, it's done by a satellite, because the infrared is from the ground can be difficult because of water vapor. In any case, this is what one learns. There are silicates and, and particles made of amorphous carbon, presumably depending on whether they come from an O-rich or, or a C-rich uh, stellar atmosphere and are blown into the interstellar medium in old age. Uh, in the cold cores that I've been showing you, there's a mantle of ices. The ices are not exotic because the technique is not that sensitive, and the, the most abundant one is water ice, and then carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methanol. So these are very, very standard uh, molecules in the, in the laboratory. Size distribution of dust particles comes from more diffuse clouds for the most part, where you can actually see this scattering of an extinction of visible radiation as a function of wavelength. 
Then there are smaller then there are smaller species that are really individual molecules called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and they're seen actually in emission. It's not thermal emission; it's actually pumped through excited uh, vibrational states, uh, through electronic states, and then emits. Uh, they then emits. All right. What about a little bit about the chemistry? Well, these cold cores, the molecules may be exotic, but the chemistry is rather simple because it's strongly constrained by low density and low temperature. Okay, so I said before 10 to the fourth, the 10 to the sixth would refer to objects that are collapsing. So anyway, the low density means that you have to have binary collisions. So only two things can come together at any given time. The low temperature means the chemical reactions cannot have barriers and they have to be exothermal. So it's like, in a sense, it's like nucle nuclear fusion. If you fuse two hydrogen atoms to form helium, there's a big barrier. We can't have a big barrier. Chemistry uh, doesn't have big barriers compared with nuclear fusion, but still, it's big enough to stop something from occurring at 10 Kelvin. All right, so the, the, the types of reactions that typically don't have barriers, at least in one channel, are reactions involving charged species and neutral species. They have strong long-range forces, and uh, they tend not to have barriers. They tend to uh, go rather quickly. In fact, some of them are faster at low temperature than at high temperature. All right, there are also some rad reactions involving neutral radicals. These are reactive neutral species with an odd number of electrons. The major source of ionization, by the way, the general source is cosmic rays, both formed and presumably accelerated towards near the speed of light in, uh, in supernovae. There are local sources also like X-rays or even far ultraviolet photons. So these, these give birth to a very, very rich chemistry. But there's also a chemistry on the surfaces of dust particles. And the two important uh, types of chemistry, first one that converts the atomic hydrogen blown out of previous generations of older stars into molecular hydrogen, and another that actually builds up these mantles of Isis. So the ices aren't really just accreted from the gas, but there's an active chemistry that goes on. All right. Very briefly, uh, to show you uh, uh, how some molecules could be made and why the chemistry is exotic, okay, we're gonna just see how water and this so-called OH or hydroxyl radical could be formed in the gas. Uh, molecular hydrogen, as I'll show you, is formed on the surfaces of dust particles and goes into the gas. This is an ionization step. Cosmic rays, unlike photons, can easily penetrate through, through most objects in the interstellar medium and ionize things as they go along. They can have up to billions of electron volts, and remember, it's only, what, uh, 15, 20 electron volts at most to do individual ionizations. So they can do quite a few of them. All right, this H2 plus then reacts with molecular hydrogen. These are well-studied chemical reactions. H3 plus is formed. It is a very, is rather stable as ions go because it isn't destroyed with molecular hydrogen and actually has been detected from the ground. It uh, had, doesn't have a dipole moment, which means it can't have a rotational spectrum of any strength, but it actually was seen in the infrared in which the criteria is a derivative of a dipole moment. Let's follow what happens. It reacts with atomic oxygen. This is called a proton transfer reaction. This is a very strange beast, which in a cold cloud reacts with molecular hydrogen, set n equal to one here. It makes a water ion plus hydrogen, then there's another reaction. Anyway, it gets up to H3O plus, which is stable, uh, relatively stable, and has also been detected. It comes apart by reactions with electrons, and the dominant product is OH, not water. It's been seen in storage rings, such as the one here. All right, what does this show you? Well, first it shows you that you have radicals and you have ions, and it shows you that even if you put all the hydrogens around the oxygen that chemistry allows, it still comes apart with electrons and knocks away most of those hydrogens, and so you end up with what are called unsaturated or hydrogen-poor species. If I, show, if I started with carbon rather than oxygen, I could, I could write down a thousand reactions making all sorts of hydrocarbons and other species, typically hydrogen-poor or what a chemist would call unsaturated. 
Now, at higher temperatures, if we want to look at some gas near a star, it's a much, it's much harder problem in chemistry because then almost every type of reaction can occur, not just these exotic ones. Okay. Next, chemical models. Now, for various regions in the interstellar medium, we, we try to uh, run chemical simulations. So if we were doing a cold cloud, we would put in as many of these iron molecule and so-called recombination reactions as, as possible. We also have to worry about surface chemistry, which I haven't yet discussed. And the idea is using various mathematical techniques to solve for the concentrations, or what we call abundances, as a function of time. Now, sometimes we solve for abundances. Sometimes, if, an, uh, if a source is very heterogeneous, Individual concentrations uh, don't make too much sense because they're so different from one uh, part of the source to another. So we either plot and calculate columns, or we actually could do spectra. We could do contour diagrams of equal, uh, concent uh, equal column or equal intensity. Anyway, there are a lot of ways of plotting the data depending on, on what the source is. Uh, we also have uncertainties in these results, especially for abundances. What we do is we start with uncertainties in the rates of the chemical reactions. Often these uncertainties are themselves uncertain, but we, uh, we, we, we take them for what they're worth, and we do something called a Monte Carlo calculation by varying the rates within their uncertainties. And that gives us uncertainties. It also gives us sensitivities. So we learn what are the important reactions that should be studied better and what reactions don't we need at all. Yeah. And we compare with observations. We vary physical conditions. And this is a complementary, complementary technique to the spectra. We also can then learn about physical conditions. Uh, chemistry is also a function of time, so we learn about the history or the age of the source. So it's a lot of interesting information. It is limited by chemical knowledge, and a large number of people are now uh, gainfully employed trying to study these reactions in the gas or on the surfaces of, of dust particles. All right. So I mentioned cold cores. There, there, there's lots in the interstellar media, but I don't have time to talk about uh, all, the, all the different types of sources. So I just thought I'd show you an old picture now of what, what, what uh, we understand best in star formation, which is when a single low mass star gets formed. Starting from one of these cold cores, the first stage here is called isothermal collapse. So the object starts to collapse. It's isothermal because uh, the, the energy is radiated away in some part of the spectrum. Eventually, we get a, something dense in the middle here, and it's called a pre-stellar core. And then this becomes what's called optically thick, which means uh, it no longer can radiation get out. And so it really starts to heat up. And then we get to this protostellar stage. We have a very hot center here, which will eventually become a star. We have um, uh, violent winds and shocks coming out of this. The cold material is still collapsing inward, and we catch it in spectra when it gets up to temperatures of 100 to 300 Kelvin, and the molecules are completely different now. All the organic chemistry becomes terrestrial. So the molecules, if you've ever had a chemistry course that you study as uh, solvents in the laboratory, are found in the gas phase and the so-called hot cores. But most important is the disk it forms, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. And so this, uh, this, this proto, so-called protoplanetary disk uh, is presumably the recipient of molecules from this, this, this hot core. Eventually, everything gets blown away except for the disk and the star, and many of these disks then develop planets, and uh, we have lots of exoplanets, so we now even have statistics on what fractions of these disks actually do form planets. And at least in one case, there's life, except for the life business. Uh, all of these objects we do run simulations for. Uh, and so chemistry is indeed, I think, a, a useful subject. Uh, let me now mention surface chemistry, which, or ice chemistry, which is uh, uh, much more poorly understood, although a, a large number of people have started to, uh, to, uh, to study these things. First, uh, I'd like to divide the surface processes into two. The first one is for these cold cores I started to talk about. Here, it's a question of things landing and sticking. So if two hydrogen atoms land and stick, they cannot, by the way, stick to each other in the gas. 
because they would have to give off a photon, and it's a very, very slow process. Study first by saltpeter. Theoretically, it's too slow to measure. But objects, uh, hydrogen atoms can stick. They bind weakly. It's called physisorption. They're able to move in a random walk, find one another, and then actually even come off, either during the reaction or afterwards just by evaporation. The ice is formed when heavier material comes down. So if an oxygen atom comes down, a hydrogen atom actually moves faster than an oxygen atom, even at 10 Kelvin, can make this OH, another hydrogen makes water. And one can get up to 100 monolayers of these ices by similar reactions. The most uh, complex that we see is called methanol, and that's uh, CH3OH. Okay. That's one stage. Now when there's the warm-up to form a hot core, one already starts with about 100 monolayers of ice. And what happens if, uh, as the warm-up occurs is that uh, not only atoms, but even heavier molecules start to move. Okay? They still don't evaporate much. Anything that gets back into the gas phase, it's a non-thermal process such as photodesorption. So a, a gas phase is maintained, but uh, most of these ices stay. Uh, they move around, they're not reactive, but when they're hit by photons, one can, uh, uh, radicals can be made. And these radicals are reactive species. It's thought that they come together to make these terrestrial type solvents, these organic molecules. But meanwhile, they, the, the, the ice gets heated and eventually the mantle is lost into the gas phase, which is convenient because we can only detect them in the gas phase. We cannot, we cannot detect these complex molecules on, on, on an ice. So this, by the way, this, this business, this phase here, this, this is only a few years old, our thinking in this way. So the exotic chemistry was understood 30, 40 years ago. The terrestrial chemistry was still working on it. All right. So here's an astronomical picture of a spectrum. This is, of course, like any beautiful spectrum in astronomy, too complicated to explain, but uh, this is Orion KL, okay? This is a giant molecular cloud, unlike the Taurus region. This has thousands of stars of all masses forming or existing. And what you see here has nothing to do with the spectrum. This is a high mass star forming region, so it's a, a called an H2 region, there's a, and then there's a a lot of light here, and the hydrogen is mostly atomic. Eventually, far enough away, it becomes more molecular. Uh, in addition, as I'll show you later, there's a source in front of this, which you're not seeing, called an outflow source. But the hot core I wanted to show you, which is the, the one at a few hundred Kelvin, is actually be behind this. So this is actually the first public spectrum from this Herschel satellite in which uh, the people didn't give out the frequencies. But if you take a look at some of the assignments, so these are standard molecules now in the terrestrial laboratory. So all the exotic, almost all the exotic stuff has been replaced by methanol, ether, all these sorts of things. So it is a really, a really interesting change that happens as one gets closer to the formation of planets. So anyway, models for this sort of thing have to take you up to 300 degrees. If, if, on the other hand, you're interested, say, in the chemistry right near one of these high mass stars, in which it can get much hotter, uh, you again have to worry just about a gas, you have to worry just about a gas phase chemistry because you can't have an ice. You might have uh, some hydrogen formed at high temperatures. There are mechanisms, uh, different mechanisms involving strong bonds to a surface of hydrogen atoms called chemisorption. In addition, uh, I don't want to go into this in detail, we do have to worry about more and more types of reactions. And the most important are ones with molecular hydrogen because <coughs> even if a reaction has a barrier, there's so much molecular hydrogen, it's still important. And then you have to worry about reverse reactions. It's, it's, as I said, it's a mess. All right. So that's the background of the subject, okay? So you get a, get a sense of what chemistry can do and a sense of the problems that uh, still exist. So now to the telescopes and some new puzzling results. Okay. First one, I'm going to talk about an observation made with ALMA, uh, and that has to do with organic molecules seen right up against black holes. This is an extragalactic work. I'm gonna show you that this is from Herschel, Polyatomic molecules seen in very diffuse, wispy clouds, which we thought were mostly atoms with except for a few diatomic molecules 
so much for that. I'm going to show you some reactive ions in, re in these outflow regions, which have no business being seen, but are seen anyway. I'm going to discuss, and then if there's time, I'll discuss uh, what's called ortho-power ratios. Uh, this has to do with molecules that can exist with two different uh, overall nuclear spins, and what they tell us. And what I won't discuss today are the abundances of, of these terrestrial type molecules, which we used to think were only in, in, in places like hot cores, but now, at least at smaller abundance, are now found back in the cold cores where the chemistry uh, was predicting only these exotic molecules. So, so we still have lots of problems thanks to, thanks to these observations. And in fact, this last observation, it wasn't even with a new telescope. It was with a refurbished old one. All right, so the black hole business. This is one of the closer of a type of galaxy called an, uh, with something called an active galaxy. The center has a very big black hole here. The red is X-ray, uh, X-rays, uh, most like a scattered X-rays. So a lot of X-rays coming from the black hole from the center. You can sort of see a disk here. Okay? This is much, much bigger, I assure you, than a protoplanetary disk, considering this is about 20 parsecs away. Megaparsecs away, excuse me. Anyway, molecules are seen in the standard way by rotational emission, but up to recently we had no real, we knew they were in the disk, but that was about it. The disk ranges from 10 Kelvin to 1,000 Kelvin, depending on, on where it, the position is. And uh, so we had to use a, this, this, uh, this, this high temperature gas network, which we had constructed recently, in which we extended the gas phase up to about 1,000 Kelvin. Okay, so we, we had lots of data. Uh, the, 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 the biggest uncertainty, by the way, is the models of disks here. It's, it's, it's poorly understood compared with protoplanetary disks in our own galaxy. And uh, so we had about four or five very different models. All of the models, by the way, the disks flare out as one gets farther away. So here's what one sees from uh, this is cycle zero, Alma. One sees uh, molecules that are in the center where the black hole is would be here. So for C18O, we have a nice ring. For C13O, and remember, we have to worry about specific transitions because radiative transfer is very important here. All right. So, so here, on the other hand, this molecule is peaked right at the nucleus. Right at the nucleus means right on the, to the resolution you can see right at the black hole. Methanol, okay, this seems to be more of a ring molecule. Uh, they were in a, too much of a hurry, I think, to send this to me because there's no transition here that's mentioned. All right, so we have ring molecules and we have nucleus-dominated ones. Here are, here are they, these are organic molecules. So this is cyanoacetylene. And cyanoacetylene is very happy to lie right next to the black hole. SO seems to be also, although I don't know what transition it is. All right, another picture showing once we thought life was simple, I mean, the molecules either in the center or on the ring, nothing in between. Well, anyway, here's something now called the West Ridge, or something like that, or in addition. And here's, so this is only, this is for the J equals three to two, if not for one to zero, for this molecule, CN. And here, I don't know why this is here. Here's another CS showing that's just in the center. So we used to think the molecules were spread out. So now you see it's, uh, it's different. All right. So here was one of our first, uh, first uh, calculations here. This is now, you see, you're seeing a slice of a, a so assumed cylindrically shaped disk that flares out. This is the black hole here, mysterial material coming in. This is the height in parsecs, the distance from the black hole in parsecs. And the color it, uh, has to do with now the fractional abundance. So for HCN, which is an organic molecule, this prediction has most of it, the highest abundance is closest to the black hole. Now this is an, a very unusual disk model. It's a very thin disk that's very dense, especially in, uh, in here. So there's a lot of protection. Enough x-rays to flow to uh, power the chemistry. So it would be called an X-ray dominated region rather than a cosmic ray dominated region. But most of our models do not get this, okay? So to get organic molecules close to the center, we really do require uh, this special model, which was by a 
former colleague at Ohio State by the name of Todd Thompson. All right. But this is abundance. Of course, what you see uh, is intensity. So this is an example in which we have to do radiative transfer. So we have to mimic what you see. And in fact, when I was first sent this, I thought this was the observation. It looked so real, but this is what comes out of the radiative transfer. So this is HCN 3 to 2 calculation. And look, this is also peaking right in, 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 in the middle here. So this, as far as I could tell from the resolution, this is at least the, the peak is at 10 parsecs or so from the, from, from the black hole. Interesting. Is it right? Well, I think we, we have to uh, actually do this sort of thing for other molecules also. And we have no idea, of course, why it's either here or there <laughs> with very little in between. All right, so now on to the next, uh, the next one. Uh, this is now with a Herschel, another confusion. This, uh, most of this comes from so the so-called PRISMIS program headed by Marie Vaughan in Paris, uh, Marie Vaughan Guerin in Paris. And uh, this, is, this is supposed to be a stand-in for our own galaxy. <laughs> so, because I mean, only have a cartoon of it, so this is another. The idea is to look at so-called diffuse clouds in spiral arms. Diffuse clouds I haven't talked about uh, uh, up to now. These are, uh, are, uh, have lower densities than the, the cold cores. They're presumably at earlier stage that hasn't yet collapsed to them. Uh, the gas is, uh, can be mostly atomic to mostly molecular. The translational kinetic temperature is something like 50 to 100 Kelvin. Most of the molecules are in the lowest rotational state. If we're going to study these, it's going to be, in, for the most part, in absorption. So you need a lamp. So here is an example of such a lamp. Some, in this case, it's the center of the galaxy. It could be any high mass star forming region that puts out some continuum through the dust in the, in the far infrared. All right, not only do you see diffuse clouds along the line of sight if it's far enough away, you see warm, dense material surrounding the source. So you see two types of absorption from warm, dense material and cooler, diffuse material. Here are some of the molecules detected in the far infrared, including new ones. Uh, but the key I want, uh, first for these strange molecules, OH plus and H2O plus, which should be destroyed on every collision with molecular hydrogen. However, in the diffuse regions, if it's mostly atomic hydrogen, we can, we can escape. Uh, in the dense regions, then it's, it's very hard to understand. And I'll show you these are in dense regions also right up against the source. Here's the, the puzzle. This is, this is a polyatomic molecule, uh, ammonia here. And this is pretty big for a diffuse cloud. And so uh, we try to understand it in the first paper, and we didn't. So here, here are various types of models. This is for calculating abundances. That's uh, concentration divided by the gas concentration. The, the horizontal lines are what's observed. These are as a function of temperature, and the, uh, the, the dashed lines are at a slightly warmer temperature than the solid lines. Unfortunately, if you look at ammonia, forget about the rest now, uh, the, only, the, the only one that works is a model of a very dense cloud. Now, we know this ammonia is not coming from a dense cloud. It's coming from diffuse clouds. These are the diffuse cloud models. In other words, we're not even close. And, uh, <laughs> So it's the same, I'm afraid, even, even, even to NH and NH2. We don't, uh, we, we don't really, really understand what, what's, what's going on. Okay. Some of these models, by the way, are gas phase models only. The slightly better ones are uh, the, uh, for example, this one is a gas grain model. So it looks like we are producing most of the ammonia on grains, and then it comes off into the gas. Uh, no, I, 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 no, <laughs> I don't think so. No, no. All right, so that's so we're confused by polyatomic molecules. Now there had been indications in previous work in which the labs were extragalactic quasars that there were polyatomic molecules, but this just uh, makes the problem worse. All right, now this that picture I showed you of Orion, I said there was an outflow source. 
This is, the, this is this very ratty spectrum. This is what comes from Herschel here. And what's plotted, forget any emission lines, because that, that's, that's coming from a hot core. We don't want, worry about it. What we want to, uh, I want to show you are absorption lines. It's plotted against the velocity. And uh, the, 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 the outflow source, I mean, uh, forget anything that has positive velocities. That's from inside the cloud. The negative ones, what's coming to us, that's the, the outflow source. So, and, uh, Forget about these blue stuff, that's methanol. Anyway, here's HF. Uh, we, can, we, we see that this outflow source is very complicated. It's not just one velocity, it's a mess. Very turbulent type of thing. And there's evidence for OH+, plus. there's evidence for H2O+, plus. there's really no evidence for H3O+. Plus. This is crazy, because uh, the chemistry I showed you was that uh, OH+, plus went to H2O+, plus. H2O+, plus went to H3O+, plus. and uh, and this happens in every discharge in the laboratory, so what's going on? So anyway, uh, numerically, there's OH plus is twice the H2O plus, much more than the H3O plus. All right. So we've had a variety of models, so this is still work in progress, if that's the word, in any case, or in preparation or something. Anyway, how do we explain this? Well, I have a very ambitious student, and he's explained it with a, what's called a time-dependent photon-dominated region. That means this thing is really being blasted by photons. And the heterogeneous region, the closer to the photons, the warmer it is. And he follows the chemistry, actually, as the stars are turning on in Orion. So he worked with a stellar astronomer that he needs, a, he needs, for example, to have a lot of water as ice in early stages and eventually to be evaporated. And in the last stage, all of the O and B stars have turned on and you're really blasting the material. That, but it's coming out at us and only a certain portion near the sources of radiation gets hot enough to, uh, to make these very strange species. In fact, the, the best conditions that he claims, 400 Kelvin in the gas, 95 Kelvin for the dust, and very little extinction. And even though he gets has a very high abundance, he gets almost as much atomic hydrogen as molecular hydrogen, and a very high abundance of electrons. And the chemistry that's doing it is a gas phase chemistry at this stage. All right. Very briefly here, all right, Th these are the reactions I showed you before. The difference now is competing with H2 are electrons. Yeah, and uh, competing with uh, that, in fact, the most important thing is, is the H2O plus and the OH plus are formed mostly by photoionization because we have 10,000 times the normal radiation field. There is some, uh, x-rays do something as well. Uh, H3O plus is destroyed more quickly because there are more electrons. And it goes into water and OH, which are photoionized. So yes, it seems that we can explain it. Okay? But of course, we then have to make predictions for many other molecules to, you know, to see if you believe this model, because it's not unique. Now, the final thing I have time to discuss, uh, I don't understand at all unless the observations are just wrong which is my conclusion at the present stage. Any case, this has to do with the ion H2O+. I know it's very reactive ion, but right now I'm concerned with the two forms of it. One is called para and one is called ortho. Para has a total nuclear spin of zero, which means one proton up, one proton down. Ortho has uh, both spins in the same direction, so a degeneracy of three. And uh, the, in the gas phase, different rotational levels, and these are, these are rotational designations for an asymmetric top molecule, different rotational levels either have para or orthonuclear symmetry. And if you just have a non-reactive collision, you cannot change the nuclear spin. It's changed in a plasma typically by uh, actually protons moving from one molecule to another. All right, so anyway, so this is now, this 30 Kelvin, astronomers, as you know, like to do energy and temperature, just shows you this is the energy difference between the lowest ortho state and the lowest power state. 
to occur, or states, because there's a fine structure and hyperfine structure. It's very complicated. So as the temperature goes to zero, you expect the ortho to para ratio, if it could convert and be thermalized, goes down to goes up to infinity because everything goes down to the lowest level. If, on the other hand, the temperature goes to infinity, uh, in the normal case, you would say three, because there would be three times as many levels for ortho as for para. But this is a diffuse cloud I'm talking about. And diffuse clouds are the, everything's in the ground rotational state. And the overall degeneracies are the same, so it should be one to one. So you should go for numbers should exist between one to infinity. And the number that's measured is five. So at least it's between one and infinity. Now, no one has ever heard of a five to one ratio before. So we th thought we would look at this in some detail. All right. And the detail here is we have to, this is a very complicated system. We have to worry about three processes. One is how it's formed. One is whether it's thermalized first or is it destroyed first. And then we have to solve all the coupled equations. All right. Now, here's the re reaction that forms it, which you've now seen several times. It's just now we have to decide whether it goes into a para form or an ortho form. Molecular hydrogen has para and ortho in diffuse clouds at about a one-to-one -one ratio. So it's thermalized at te standard temperature between 50 and 100 Kelvin. All right, now the, the easiest thing is to imagine that thermalization occurs by, by collisions with hydrogen atoms. Not by collisions with hydrogen molecules, because that destroys it, but by collisions with hydrogen atoms. And by switching atoms, you can go between one spin and another. All right. Now, mathematically, that says the ortho to para ratio is thermalized, and this is a standard thermalization formula, detailed balance. The degeneracies, the Gs are the same, so it's just e to the 30. And you know it's not going to work, so you call the new temperature spin temperature. Because you, you know, essentially, you're just defining a spin temperature. It's nothing more than the ortho to power ratio of 4.8 leads to a spin temperature of 20 Kelvin, which I think is totally meaningless. As the temperature is 50 to 100 Kelvin, the translational temperature, and the spin temperature, if things were thermalized, should be the same. It isn't. On the other hand, if we insist that they should be the same, then we can only get 1.4 to 1.8. Okay, no in the 4.8. So I, I think that's good evidence that in, unless the astronomy is wrong, it's not thermalization. So we have a more complicated case of destruction. And the destruction happens, uh, we assume the destruction doesn't care whether it's ortho or para, it just happens. And so then it's the formation that's very important. And then we have to know, we have to do quantum mechanics of angular momenta to figure out. Uh, unfortunately for the quantum mechanics, it depends upon how the reaction happens, whether it's a long range hopping or a short range complex, okay? You could work it out, and we've worked it out, and now three of us working on this problem. And without going into great detail, you get a formula in which the ortho to para ratio is equal to what this means is the F of PO means the fraction starting in para hydrogen that ends up in ortho H2O plus. Okay? And this is the measure. Ortho to para ratio of molecular hydrogen in diffuse clouds is one to one. So depending on how the, how the formation goes via a complex or via hopping, we can get as high as three to one as low as 2 to 1, we cannot get to 4.8 to 1. So we don't have enough stuff falling into the lowest state. So we have this uh, one person in the world who specializes in calculations in which you could actually have a radiative emission it seems to violate nuclear physics, but to go from a para state to an ortho state. And the reason is, it, these are molecules in which the nuclear spin is not a good quantum number because it interacts with the electron spin. And this molecule has an electron spin of a half. So the nuclear spin is not a perfectly good quantum number. You actually can have radiation. And he calculates this to be at 0.01 per year, which is slow even in astronomy. And actually, if it were 100 times faster, 
it might solve the problem, but as it is, it doesn't solve the problem. We are out of solutions. Uh, this was another suggestion about stimulated mission, which I'll ignore. And so the suggestion is that the astronomy is wrong. Okay, that's the only thing we can think of. I have consulted all experts that I know of on this problem. So uh, the, the person who did the observations is named Peter Schilke, and he's in, in Bonn, uh, in Cologne, excuse me, he used to be in Bonn, he's in Cologne, and he's worried about his own observation. He told me in a month, he'll tell me whether he still thinks it's right. All right. On that note, <laughs> in which you can see we only partially understand a lot of what new telescopes are telling us, I will end with the standard acknowledgments, the sources of funding, and to the people who do most of the work. And thank you. <laughs>
energy to stabilize itself. So we didn't consider this for the hot core models because these reactions are only fast at low temperature. They go with t to the minus a big power, t to the minus 3, t to the minus 3 to half. And so you really want to look for a low temperature system. So there are three reactions we think might be very important that we have missed. And uh, as we speak, my postdoc Anton Ross Unit is actually doing calculations on these things. The basic problem we have is we have to try to fill a lot of new molecules. So, so I, I think this will work. But we have, uh, it's based on uh, very quick calculations of minus to what the rates are for these reactions. And so that has to be done slowly. We have to get potential surfaces and you know, actually do a better job of that too. Finally, there's a group that's done experiments and they claim at 8 Kelvin that they, they shine photons in, which is our mechanism for doing it in hot cores. They shine in photons and they claim they get a chemistry. Now that violates what I thought was the, uh, uh, our understanding was at 10 Kelvin. It's very hard to get big species to move, and so I'm not sure. It might be the following that when in the laboratory it's not like one photon every hour. Or so. You know, these things are blasted, and maybe it isn't thermal. But maybe even when one photon comes in, it's not thermal for a while. And so we're trying to look at non-thermal processes. For example, something can move much faster uh, when it's non-thermal than it can when it thermalizes and has to go by uh, uh, a random water process. So you've got a lot of possibilities. Now, not only cold cores, <laughs> it's now these complex molecules are being seen in other sources as well. So they're probably going to be found everywhere. Okay? We know they're in the, uh, throughout the center of the galaxy, even outside of where we assumed it was uh, shocks that uh, could get them off cold rays, but that's not 10 Kelvin. The 10 Kelvin is the really hard. If, you, if cold cores was starting at 30 Kelvin, <laughs> then there's enough motion for us to make ices. We can't get the stuff to evaporate, but non-thermal disruption might work. But if you really believe 10 Kelvin, I think we, we need to I spoke with Karen, and there's someone at Dina Carroll that used to be, well, used to be Kevnitz before that, Freiburg, who does have these iron traps, and is now temporarily in anyway, a clone. And I did mention these reactions to him. I don't know if it will happen or so. We have evidence that they, they do happen. In a, uh, what is evidence? Well, in a, in a standard laboratory source, you can't see this radiative process because it's, it's slower than a three-body process in which things come together, and a third body stabilizes. Now, that means if you see such a thing, there's a good chance that at lower densities you'll see the radio. If you can't see anything in the three body limit, it's probably hopeless. But you can. So it's, it's not crazy. For one of them, there's almost evidence. There's someone, a Norwegian chemist, has studied in one of these reactions, and he used a technique called ion cyclotron resonance, which is right on the border between two body and three body. So maybe he saw it. And the other one was calculated by a, a, someone in Virginia, the colleagues. So those would be a big help in the complex molecule problem. Uh, I don't know if it will work. <coughs> and there's no guarantee that more than that, that only one mechanism. Some of the sources, by the way, you know, maybe that's an astronomical problem, but it's not obvious that some of them are very cold and completely removed from warmer stuff that could be floating in. I mean, the abundances in these cold cores are down one thousandth of what they are in, uh, in the hot cores. So it's, not a, it's just amazing to me that they actually could be detected, <laughs> given these molecules also have very complex rotational spectra. So the intensity, if any line, is going to be. 
I say fractional abundances down to 10 to the minus 11. The molecules with thousands of lines in the spectrum. And that's an old telescope. Yeah. Uh, hi, the first importance of surface chemistry. Do you see any circumstances where you might have appreciable amounts of solid hydrogen developing? That, that's a very good question. And uh, you know, unfortunately, our models are, are, uh, can get it or not get it, depending on very small changes in parameters. So uh, uh, some models do get it. Now, uh, in that other talk I gave, I talked about different ways of solving the surface chemistry. Uh, or the ice chemistry. And uh, it turns out the normal way of doing chemical kinetics with people who've had chemical kinetics does not work on small particles when you only have small numbers of reactants. So you actually have to use stochastic methods. And the high powered stochastic methods do tend to get lots of molecular hydrogen. Interesting. And then, there are methods that don't make much of a differentiation between where species are. On so that's an uncertainty because then the molecular hydrogen could be reacting too. It's another mechanism for forming water, for example, you know, uh, if it's there. Yeah. But you know, we can't really measure it to <laughs> that. Right. <laughs> so, so. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm wondering what you mean by um, the astronomy is wrong in the previous observations. I mean, what, what you have is you have a sideline. Yes, I suppose that in your uh, equilibrium chemistry calculations, you're picking one of these guys. Could you... He claimed, he claimed and you're right. It is very different. Uh, this is a complicated story. You know? When you do, uh, 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 when you have spiral arms, of course, they, they, they are distinguished one spiral arm from another by velocity. Right? But of course, if you have lots of diffuse clouds within one spiral arm, it gets hard. And it indeed is a very difficult problem to, to distinguish all of these sources along the line of sight. But he claims they all are along this line of sight. That it, 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 despite this velocity business, 4.8 fits every one size fits all the ratio. That's the claim. Now, I'm not an expert, right? What I meant by astronomical is it, it's not a basic problem in physics. That you know, with this awful power stuff, this is basic physics. Yeah. 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 Right. And, uh, I think we have all the processes that we need. I mean, considering, you know, when we're desperate enough to consider radiative transitions with the different spins, we're trying everything we can go. Could, we can. Could, could it be that, that you that the, the nuclear spin represents the temperature uh, as the material was some time ago, and then the heat map and the, the spin temperature just takes longer time to. Yeah, it, 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 it's, uh, yeah, but um, why would, it, you know, we have, well, if, if we have the reaction right that does it, it shouldn't. This is a diffuse cloud, atomic hydrogen is very abundant in a diffuse cloud. The, we think we know the cross-sections for the elastic collisions or whatever it does, though. But, so, I don't know, I think we should have the time scales. I mean, we solve these things as a function of now, is there something very unusual that's happening? Perhaps. But Peter told me to wait a while. <laughs> and then we'll see. We're hoping for our freezing present from Peter and then our. No, no, you know, if it's right, it's still interesting. It's still, you know, it's, it's still a you know, basic problem with physics. The astronomy is trying to tell us something. Okay, so I would suggest if there are further questions, uh, we go for dinner with the speaker, as usual.